Let's read from Malachi chapter 1, verse 7. Verse 7, you offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. In, in other translations, when it says the table of the Lord, it's speaking of the altar. And what is the altar to the Jewish people? This is where the sacrifices are killed. This is where they're burnt and offered to the Lord. This is the place where the priests come, take the coals from this altar. Where do they take it? Into the, to, to the temple. They put it on this altar of incense and add incense to these burning coals. And the incense arises before the mercy seat. So they're beginning to call this contemptible. The, the word contemptible means like a base or a low or not so important thing. So this is the attitude of the priests at this time. The, the altar, the ministry and the priests are in the temple. Yeah, it's, it's, it's our day-to-day job. It's not that great. It's, it's actually kind of getting boring and old after a while. Verse 8, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with it? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord? So they're, they're bringing these, these sacrifices that are so half-hearted. You know, can you imagine bringing a cow before your, your governor and half of his eyes kind of out, and the cow's got a bad limp, and it's got some, you know, roughed up places on it? Here, governor, we, we brought this to you. We thought you'd be happy with this. And, you know, here's this rich man with power and influence, and he's looking at this straggly cow like, Wow, thanks. I feel really appreciated. No. Do you, do you see the picture here? That how God, in his heart, he's feeling as these people are coming with this half-hearted response. Just It's out of duty. It's out of tradition. It's out of our religion that we have to do these. You, God, you said us, to, told us to do this a long time ago, so we're doing it, and we hope that you're happy. And Hey, who cares if we don't get a perfect one every time? Like, really, who, who really cares? God cares. He really does. He's worth perfection. He's worth everything. He's the maker of heaven and earth. And so what's happening here is their view of God is beginning to come lower and lower. Just the busyness, the cares of life. They just are not carrying that burning passion in their hearts anymore. And I believe that what God is most wanting to do is to elevate and purify our thoughts of who he is in our generation. There is such a need right now in our, in, from preachers, from mothers, from everybody across the body of Christ that our thoughts would be elevated of who God is, that they would be purified, and that they would be anointed by the Holy Spirit, that when we close our eyes and we think about God, that we can't help but worship. This is what is meant to happen in our hearts. Verse 9, but now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Even if you jump over to chapter 2, verse 2, or I'll read verse 1. This is connected here. It says, and now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and you will curse And I will curse your blessings. Yes, I've cursed them already because you did not take it to heart. So these guys are in a serious place of not recognizing how far that they'd they'd been falling, how cold their hearts had become. Verse 10, chapter 1. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle fire at my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts nor will I accept an offering from your hands. So he's asking, who is there among you who would just shut the doors? All this worship, this half-hearted stuff that you guys are giving me right now, it is in vain. It doesn't mean anything. If it's not moving your heart, it's not going to move my heart. And so God is looking in our hearts today that when, you know, I think about different times as we're in the prayer room and we're we're praying into different issues. If those issues aren't stirring your heart, they're not going to stir God's heart. He's looking for hearts that are connected to his heart, who are feeling what he's feeling. And from that place, from that revelation, as we ask him for things, as we're connected to what he's connected to, that's when God wants to move and release his kingdom and his authority. So he's looking for somebody here who has the boldness to recognize that what we're doing is in vain. We're wasting our time. 
And who's going to just shut the whole temple doors? Let's shut this thing down. Let's entreat the Lord. Let's come back to him. Let's just stop wasting our time with half-heartedness. Let's get our priorities right again, and let's give him what he's worthy of. Come on, people. Let's gather around. Let's, let's repent. Let's get on our faces. Let's fast and weep between the porch and the altar. You know, there's a call for this in this. So then we, we get this amazing prophecy in the midst of just God just picking them apart. He's so honest. He doesn't leave anything undone or unseen. Verse 11. So now Malachi, he prophesies. He says, for from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. I'm going to read on. I'll come back to this verse in a second. But you profane it, and that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts, and you bring the stolen, the lame, the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. God's name is to be feared. These people are, they're, these priests had lost touch with the fear of the Lord. They, they, they were coming to this place of complacency. They had lost touch with the greatness of who God is. And I want to read it again. This is what God is doing in our generation right now. From the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, in China, in Tibet, in Africa, in South America, in every place, name your city right now, in every place, incense, worship, shall be offered to my name, for my name shall be great among the nations. So through, through Malachi, God prophesies to the Jewish people. He says, if you guys will not recognize my greatness, guess what? My salvation is going to go to the Gentiles, and they're going to get connected to my greatness. And what's going to happen over time is they begin to have a revelation of who I am and my power and my glory is 24-7, day and night, they're going to begin to worship from the rising of the sun to its going down. And you know what? It's not just going to happen in one geographical area. It's going to begin to happen all over the nations. And you know what's going to happen to you, Jewish people? You know what's going to happen to you, Israel? That when the nations are in their place as those priests, as a kingdom of priests, and they are giving me what is due my name, do you know what's going to happen? It's going to so provoke you, Israel, to jealousy. The, the nations are worshiping your God. God, and it's going to turn your hearts, and you're going to see that you were called to be priests before me, and you are going to call out to my name again, and you're going to come back into your rightful place and give me what I'm worthy of, because I'm a great king. Amen? So this is, this is really where we're going right now, that God is releasing this worship and prayer all over the nations right now, and he's going to use us extolling him out of that revelation of his greatness, out of his glory, out of his undescribable worth. It's from that place that we give him this extravagant love. And the Jewish people are eventually going to find out and they're going to look and they're going to hear and they're going to get touched by it and say, we were meant to do that. We want to come back to this. There's a glory. There's a joy. There's a power. There's a calling. There's a destiny. There's a satisfaction. There's a peace in coming back into our, our irrevocable calling to be priests before the living God. Amen. So God's doing this. Oh, and I'm so excited about it. So the last point I want to just make before I close is I fully believe that the knowledge of God is the fuel of this worship and prayer movement. It's not a man-based thing, but it's a God-centered thing. And the knowledge of God, I believe, is the greatest need in the earth right now. What, what am I talking about when I say the knowledge of God? I, one of the ways I picture it and have experienced personally is when I am able to close my eyes and I begin to speak with God, what am I seeing in my mind and what is happening in my heart? That it is a living reality. Not that I can just quote some Bible verses to you and sound eloquent. and No, 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 no. 
when I'm talking about the knowledge of God, I'm coming from a place where I've connected to who he is. I've sat at his feet. I have heard his voice. It has stirred me on the inside. It has awakened me. It has brought me to a place of life and abundance and power. And I know who I am and I have an identity. And when now when I speak about the living God, I'm not giving dry, boring, cold information, but I'm coming from a burning heart. And when my words come off of my lips, your hearts are getting ignited because the knowledge of God is living and active on the inside of me. And I believe that this is what God is doing. He's raising up these houses of prayer all over the nations right now. And it's like a greenhouse. He's drawing his messengers into these chairs to sit before him, to worship, to set their eyes on him hour after hour. And over time, their cold heart begins to get awakened. They begin to sit in the word of God and they begin to let it sit over them and judge them and move in them and stir and break off lies and speak into their hearts and set them straight. And then they begin to know who they are. And then from that place, he begins to speak and he begins to say, this is what I'm doing in the earth right now. And he begins to give us ears. He awakens our ears to hear what he's saying. He begins to open our eyes. What is he doing? And then he begins to show us this is where it's all going. And our hearts come alive and we find purpose and our calling and oh, there's nothing else you can give me money to do. This is what I want to do. And he's, he's doing this in hearts of people that he's so convincing them of who he is. This is what God's doing. He is convincing his people of how great he really is. He's not just a story. He's not a fable. He's a living God, and he is so set on convincing us of that. It's his joy and his pleasure to do that. And so I want to encourage you as I'm closing that you would not lose heart as these priests we read about in Malachi chapter 1. That you would not lose that place of, of just seeing his beauty, his glory, of sitting before him, of allowing him to awaken our hearts. That we would not just be caught up in the, the weight of this world, the pressures of the spirit of this age, and just the day-to-day -day activities. But we would be a people who stay alive, who are watching, who are waiting. And we're allowing the knowledge of God to be awakened on the inside of us that when we're, if you're a mother sitting with your children and you're teaching the Bible or you're a father, that the word of the Lord comes forth with power. The activity of the Holy Spirit is awakening things in the children. And if you're a pastor, whatever it is in the marketplace that God's called you to, that when you have the opportunity to open your mouth, it's not some cold, dry, boring thing, but you, you can't help but keep this passion, this fire in your bones back. It's just flowing out of you. Amen.